programming tools for software development is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, our guest on this program is Don Parker. He's considered the world's leading expert on computer security. And he says something very interesting in his book on computer crime. He says, data stored in a computer can be safer than data stored by a physical means, like in a locked filing drawer of some sort. Yet here we are doing this program, and there seems to be a sense that the security of computer data is kind of vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Well, there are techniques uh, that can make data more secure, as long as those techniques are used. Uh, unfortunately, it often takes a clever individual to come along and break the system before those techniques are applied and we find out how vulnerable these systems are. Uh, you know, we're raising a whole new generation of computer-wise people through the personal computer revolution, and there's bound to be a portion of that population that's going to use that knowledge in some kind of malicious way. Uh, the, uh, today, I guess, uh, computer crime really is a problem because it's a matter of uh, information is power, and when that, po uh, that power is, is made available, through unguarded information, then it's a threat to all of us in the society. Uh, Time-sharing services are particularly vulnerable because they're designed to be shared by a number of strangers who make a phone call. And we're going to take a look and just see how easy it is to make that call. It's pretty easy to get into a computer database. All you really need is a personal computer, something like this, some terminal software. You also need a modem, which connects your telephone to your computer, a telephone, and you need to know the phone number of one of these computers. I'm going to dial up a computer database right now. I happen to know the number of one. It's just a local call. It's not even a toll call. And we'll wait to hear a high-pitched tone, which tells us that the, the host computer is answered. Okay, the computer is answered, and we're going to now just go into a normal log-on procedure in which the computer is going to first ask me for my ID number, and I happen to have one, so I'll enter that. And if the host computer now accepts my ID number as a legitimate number, it will proceed to ask me for my password. And at that time, I'm going to have to come up with uh, meeting another test here to get into the computer database. And it's now asking me for my password, which I will type in. You can't see it on the screen because the program is meant to protect the security of my password, so you can't steal it from me. And if the host accepts it as it did, you can see I'm now into this computer database. You see how easy it was for me to get into that computer database. Of course, I was a qualified user. The problem is that even unqualified users can get into these computers. They're called hackers, and they try to get into these computers just for the sake of finding out what's inside. And by using common passwords and even sometimes randomly chosen code numbers, they can get into banks, hospital records, even federal agency computers. Society has a huge investment in computers and an even greater one in software. What's more important than the financial investment is the degree to which we have come to depend upon computers. Without them, databases are empty. Words don't get processed, numbers don't get crunched, and the speed of information handling to which we have grown accustomed slows to a crawl. One might think that the protection of such essential and valuable resources would be routine and substantial. But this is not always the case. Recently, most of our time has been spent improving and expanding our systems, adding to their flexibility, making networks, and basically being more productive. The security aspects have often been overlooked. Additionally, good computer security often runs counter to making computers accessible, friendly, and easy uh, to use. In just the last four years, we have had the largest funds transfer fraud, $10.2 million. We had the largest in bank embezzlement, $21.3 million. 
We've had the largest securities fraud, $53 million. We've had the largest commodities fraud, $50 million. And the largest inventory fraud, $67 million. This is um, an indication that the more we are using computers, then the larger the losses potentially are and we're certainly breaking a lot of crime records mm -hmm. the more we Can you we give some idea what uh, characteristics of a, 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 cr a computer criminal is? What, what sort of individual do you find doing this sort of thing? Well, we've interviewed about uh, 35 of these people so far, at least of the more sophisticated uh, computer criminals. And we find that they tend to be uh, young, but then uh, people in the computer field generally are young anyway. They exhibit the Robin Hood syndrome, or it's a variation of Robin Hood. It's stealing from the rich and keeping it. But mm -hmm. it's the idea that they differentiate very strongly in doing harm to people, which is highly immoral to them, and doing harm to organizations that they can easily rationalize. Not only that, they're doing it to a computer, and the computer can't cry or hit back. And so uh, the computer is an ideal target for people who could not possibly come up and stick a gun in your face and steal money from you. That would be being a criminal. But when you can do it through a terminal or a computer, then it's an entirely different matter. These people do not, do not see themselves as, um, as criminals. They see themselves as problem solvers. They have some intense, unshareable problem that they're trying to solve. They are in a position of trust, and they find that violating that trust is the easiest way to solve their Don, problem. Are you talking about amateurs here or, or kind of career computer criminals? So far, most of the problem has been from amateur white-collar criminals. However, now we're starting to see a, a, an increasing number of what you might call career criminals, people whose uh, livelihood on a continuing basis is dependent on, on, uh, on crime. And you might expect that since for several years now, almost every major prison in the United States has been teaching data processing to the prisoners. So they do have an opportunity to learn the technology. And they're finding that they can't engage in their cr uh, traditional crime except in this new environment, this electronic what environment. Are you, uh, Don, what are some of the techniques that people uh, use, criminals use, to attack a uh, computer system? Well, we have about 1,100 cases in our research files at SRI now, and based on what we have studied over the past uh, 13 years, there are a number of, of uh, common techniques that are emerging. The most common one is we refer to as data diddling or false data entry. It's changing data before it goes into the computer, but relying on the computer to hide the evidence of the false data. We're also dealing with very sophisticated techniques such as Trojan horses, logic bombs, salami attacks, piggybacking, uh, data leakage, um, super zapping, and so on. These are all of the technical or jargon terms for these techniques. Could you take one of those and explain, for example, Trojan horse seems to be a fairly explicit term. What, what, would, the, what would that mean? It seems to imply that there's something built into the program. Is that the case? That's right. The Trojan horse is one of the most fundamental criminal methods that has been used. And it is the idea of taking a program and building secret instructions into that program. So when the program is executed in a protected domain in a computer mm -hmm. system, it not only performs what it is supposed to do, but it also does the additional and instructions unfortunately, as well. a system being friendly is almost the opposite of its being secure. And so we're trying to balance, we're trying to find the balance between a friendly system and a secure system because the number of people who have this capability to access these systems is growing uh, very rapidly. And so we have um, a, an enemy that is increasing in size and in sophistication mm -hmm. and therefore we can no longer allow our systems to be as friendly as they now have What about been. the, uh, there's a, I guess we'd call a computerized community bulletin board uh, network that's grown up around uh, the whole technical hobbyist area. Uh, you talked about a pirate uh, version of this. Can you tell us a little bit about what one of these pirate bulletin boards would be like and what the purpose is? Well, as you know, bulletin boards are extremely uh, uh, useful uh, uh, services in the computer field. 
But unfortunately, there are some of them that are set up, as you say, for malicious purposes, referred to as, as uh, pirate boards. In fact, in one listing I saw recently, we found 128 of these so-called pirate bulletin boards across mm -hmm. the country. They are used for intelligence purposes among malicious system hackers, and they often will broadcast the uh, uh, telephone numbers of computers and any passwords that may be available and describe various protocols for logging on to other people's computer systems to engage in this unauthorized access Previously, to systems. Previously, dial-up networks have the uh, requirement of dialing in and usually entering a logon or a password that the system itself requires. Now, we've gone one step further, and we've taken within a 212 modem type device, an auto dial modem that would reside on the front end of this processor, our timeshare system. You would place our device in, and it has what we call an answer verification capability. We can go through, and I'll give you an example of how we would store one. Let's say your name was Adam. We could put in your name and a password that you would use to access the system. So we enter AA for add and answer verification, and then type in your name, Adam and put a space in and then enter your unique password. And we could put in a password of anywhere from 1 to 250 now, characters. Do I understand this uh, correctly? Is that the basic idea is that you dial into the computer system and then the computer system dials back to you again to verify that you're the actual person that you say you are. Is that correct? Well, with our device, what we're doing is dialing into the system and entering a password. Once the password has been entered, at that point, you then have access to the computer system itself. Our best defense is a good offense. First, we should not be psyched out by the computer technology. We can take responsibility for computer security without being a computer expert. And if needed, experts are available. Second, we should make an overall risk assessment of what our computer threats are and determine how much it is worth to protect against these threats. Third, we can take steps to physically protect our hardware and data, as previously mentioned. Fourth, we can use security checklist guidelines to ensure that our procedures are sufficient. Fifth, we can make sure that we address the greatest non-technical exposure, the users, by making our policies clear and by following common sense practices. The sophisticated aircraft instruments developed in the 1940s and 50s created human interface problems that were entirely new to industrial designers. Mechanical devices gave way to electromechanical and electronically controlled mechanisms generating more information more rapidly and putting greater burdens on the operator. In its earliest days, ergonomics was concerned with the safety of people who used these devices in applications where an error could cause injury or loss of life. As the use of ergonomic design became more common, it quickly spread to other working environments with the goal of increasing productivity and reducing fatigue and stress. Among computer users, some major concerns surfaced in the 1970s. Muscular pain, stress, and in particular eye fatigue were the most common health complaints. Sitting in front of a video display was a radical change for most workers and led to studies on how the eye responds to CRT stimuli. In this experiment, an infrared beam follows the eye's movement across the screen, measuring pupillary responses and focusing ability when faced with characters of different polarity, sharpness, or contrast. The irritation resulting from screen glare, another major source of complaints, is measured by this test, in which different patterns at varying contrast levels are projected onto a CRT screen. As each pattern changes, the subject looks for its reflection in the screen difference between an anti-glare and a reflective screen is easy to demonstrate. Ergonomics developed as designers became aware of an obvious relationship. The efficiency of a machine depends on how efficiently it can be handled. In a field where the problems are sometimes physical and sometimes psychological, the objective is the same, to adapt machine design 
to human thought yes, and movement. Yes, I think there are some tr what we call transfer of training problems, particularly with people who have never used a terminal before, uh, in other words, a keyboard hooked up to a computer, and sometimes that's evident when people continually hit the return or a button on the right that might erase all the data. As normally they think of that return button as returning the type element back to the left side of the paper, and what happens with a terminal is that you actually return the cursor to the left-hand side of the terminal. So there is a problem with transfer of training, but it seems to be overcome very quickly. Not too long ago, there was quite a bit of concern expressed by VDT users about their safety and about the physical comfort of using a VDT terminal. I've noticed some changes since then, the detachable keyboards and all, mm -hmm. but what actually transpired there? Well, actually, several years ago, this, um, the concern of the users was brought to the attention of the manufacturers, and there was some legislation started in Europe, and as a result of the concern mainly, but also of the legislation, there's been a number of de product design changes that really better accommodates the user and makes the whole system more adaptable and more flexible for the user. have a demonstration here with the, with the HP Orion computer. Tell us what's mm -hmm. on there. This is a demonstration of um, a time planning algorithm that's typical, it's in the field known as a PERT chart and <clears throat> this is a demo of how this kind of information um, can be changed to multicolor in order to um, pick out the information on the screen that differentiates it from other parts of activities that will be going on during this person's planning of time. Okay, um, so what we saw first was a black and white chart, which wasn't too easy to decipher. Well, it was easy to see the information, but it wasn't easy to differentiate the information. One of the advantages of this display is that it has 4,029 colors, and we can vary the colors um, on parts of this display to show uh, areas that need to be differentiated and that actually help the user to discriminate parts of the information on the screen from other sections. You can see that I've color-coded the critical path in this area red. I've color-coded the slack time in green. And now what I'll do is I'll color the events with a yellow to discriminate those particular parts of the screen or the events from others. You can see it's kind of a yellowish, goldish color. Okay, that certainly makes it easier to, easier to read. You have another demonstration on text processing, which I think is um, Yes, many people don't realize that um, you can use multicolor displays for um, applications like text, text processing. Most of the time, they think of multicolor displays for CAD CAM. And what I'm actually going to do now is to bring up a menu showing you something that I've designed to show how to discriminate sections of information in a letter by using a multicolor dimension. Um, most people, when they, they write a letter to a customer, let's say I've got an, a, a shipping account, what I, what I want to do is to find out what parts of the, the letter are critical information and what parts of the letter are typical information that we might want to change on a daily basis, <clears throat> excuse me, or, or maybe not change at all. Now this takes a few seconds to bring up the program, but it's, it, it's an application that's new, it's different than CAD CAM. We're starting to use multicolored displays to study the visual and cognitive responses of, of people, which, as Karen said before, is a much more difficult problem than just the hardware design. This application would be, if, for example, you wanted to edit a standard letter? Yes, yes. It's, it can be used for editing. It can, you can use multicolored uh, coding for um, defining technical terms in a report that you may want mm -hmm. to put into a glossary. This is an example where the standard text is color coded in blue. The information that you normally change when you do a new letter maybe to a new customer is color coded in yellow and the information that's critical is color coded in kind of a, a maroon color <laughs> and particularly if you notice the last line says continued non-receipt of this payment will jeopardize future orders and that will alert the data input <clears throat> operator to the fact that this person either hasn't made his payment or there's some problem um, alerting him to the fact that maybe we don't want to send that person orders in the future or at least tell the payments received. Wanda, one last thing. In doing your demo, I see you have a kind of thumb wheel, <coughs> speaking of ergonomics, on the keyboard. That's, I, that's kind of a, a mouse of a sort, isn't it? Well, it is a mouse. What it does, actually, it moves the cursor um, around the display so that you can put various 
types of information at different spots on the, the screen. Now, one of the advantages of a thumb wheel designed into a keyboard is that it doesn't require a lot of space, space on the tabletop as would a mouse or maybe some other kind of interface device. Um, one of the things that we're interested in as human factors engineer is what kind of device should be used for a typical user in a specific application. And that's the kind of analysis we go through to design a product for specific users. Joining us now is Susan Kerr. Susan is an icon designer with the Macintosh Software Group and Jerry Manick, who's product design manager for Macintosh. Uh, we're talking, Jerry, about ergonomics on this show. How did the Mac address some of the ergonomics problems we've been discussing? Uh, there are certain basic uh, design criteria that we use for keyboards, the angle of keyboards, the uh, angle of the front screen of the Macintosh. Uh, taken out of the literature, uh, we wanted Macintosh to be able to be used by the 99th percentile uh, male, female. Also, by we knew that children would be using the Macintosh. Uh, that pretty much decided uh, the arrangement of the tube above the disk drive slot. Uh, we wanted the keyboard to be very light, to be able to be moved around easily. Uh, Macintosh itself, uh, we wanted the case to be as small as possible because it's a, a portable unit. We wanted a very strong statement of transportability, thus the handle on the top. Uh, we wanted the keyboard to be able to be easily connected and disconnected. Uh, the uh, four uh, wire coil cord uh, plugs into the front of Macintosh to, to make it easy to uh, assemble it. Uh, the disk drive is, is pretty unique, we think. The, uh, we've gone away from the soft, floppy disks that can be easily damaged with heat or uh, bringing something magnetic close to it. Uh, this hard plastic shell on the disk drive, uh, on the uh, diskette, uh, completely protects the media inside and can be used, uh, carried in your pocket without worry about uh, getting dirty or damaged. Uh, it also makes the disk drive very reliable in any, practically any climate. You can be assured that you won't lose data by using that. Tell, tell us about the mouse. That's obviously been a key part of Lisa and now Mac uh, technology. Uh, the mouse is a, a very efficient cursor pointing device. There have been a lot of studies uh, about how the most efficient way to point the cursor is. Uh, Actually, the mouse is designed to be used all the way from a child to an adult with a very light touch on your hand. Uh, the early mice, even uh, from Apple, had three buttons or two buttons on top. We worked very hard to get just the button to be a single button without having to have the person remember uh, right or left, just, just click. And uh, as Susan will show you later, the function is, uh, is done. Uh, Susan, you're, you're an icon designer, among other things. and. Uh, uh, have you learned something from the experience on Lisa as to the effectiveness of icons, how to use them, and how they fit in? Well, certainly, um, I think one of the best experiences is seeing a person who's never used a Lisa before or a Mac before, um, and even never used a computer before, it is possible, easily possible, to teach most people to use one of these computers in about 20 minutes. And a lot of that is because you can explain what an icon means and a person can remember it easily. So we certainly use Lisa as a jumping off point and making just some refinements and additions for some new features. Okay, your area, the icons, are another one of the key ergonomic aspects, I suppose, of using a Mac. Maybe you can run through a demonstration here, Susan, and show us how we use the icons to get from place to place. Tell us where we are right at this moment with Mac. Well, what you see now is the image, the icon that you get when you just plug Mac in and turn it on. It prompts you with a picture of the diskette. So you've and a question mark saying, where's my diskette? Saying, mm -hmm. I need something. Okay, so. so that all you do is, it only fits in one way, so there's no way you can break it or make a mistake. You just pop it in. You get an image of a content Mac, so you know that everything is okay and you're welcomed. It's just so that the person using Mac gets information all the time, visually, so nothing has to be translated. A little wristwatch to tell you, just wait one second. Things are happening. You, you've replaced the uh, salt timer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're moving, into, okay. moving into the 80s. So what do we have now? So what we have now is an image on the screen of the diskette that we put in the slot. And it can be with the mouse, 
it can be moved. Okay. And it's already showing you the name of that disk. Right. And it's highlighted in the sense that it's inverted so that Mac knows that you want to do something to this diskette and your choices of what you might want to do are listed in hidden menus that operate a little bit like window shades when you move your okay. cursor. So let's pull down the file menu. Mm -hmm. See, that would tell us now what? Right, that our choices. We could find out something about this diskette or we can just open it or we could eject it. But if we open it, just say open and immediately you get what we call a window that displays graphically and in words what is contained on the diskette in the machine. So you can see there's a picture of a hand painting which symbolizes a paint program and a handwriting for the word processor and a couple of uh, memos that were already written, some folders. If say you want to store a document or two in a folder, um, it's analogous to life. You just put the piece of paper in the folder. Mm -hmm. Now you've got something called a control panel here. Show me what that is. Um, always available to you are a number of desk accessories. Um, so you move the cursor to control panel, let go of the mouse button. And what do we have? So this, which looks a little bit like a dashboard, um, lets you fine-tune the system in a number of ways to your comfort level or just your personal preferences. Um, the computer will work no matter what setting. So that Such as what controls do you have? Say, here? here's a little volume control. You can see the speaker. So every now and then you hear a beep with Mac when you turn it on um, or sometimes during uh, applications. If you're at home by yourself and you're listening to the stereo, you might want to know that you'll always hear those beeps. Mm -hmm. If you're a student working in the library, you can move it so that just the bar will flash so there's no noise at all. Say some of the other features let you adjust keyboard repeat rate or a menu flash or the amount of time between double clicks, which might vary with the age of the person using right, I'm gonna, the computer. I'm going to rush it because I want to see as much of this as we can in the time we have. Sh show me Notepad and how that works. Okay. Okay. Pop, pop the control panel away by just clicking on it. And Notepad lets okay. you while you're working in any application as well as just this um, what we call the finder which is like a directory mm -hmm. be able to um, grab the keyboard and write a note to yourself uh, remember to um, read page 12 and you could say put this away or you could move it over um, show me how you flip <laughs> the pages of the notepad that's kind of impressive we can go to page two, where it says uh, another note, one left for oneself. Flip to page three, um, up to eight pages of notes that could help you in your work or just remind you of social events. Um, one of the items was uh, was scrapbook. Right, um, scrapbook lets you keep um, literally your only up to 256. You're only limited by how much memory you have free pictures or messages or documents always available for the terms we use are cutting and pasting. Maybe you can go to Mac Write and then we could build up to how you'd use that. Right. So say to open a word processor application, you could click on Mac Write and say open. If you want to get right to a document which automatically launches the application, same procedure, which is why it's easy to use. And now you're loading the, wor the, the word processing. We're loading the word processor right. and the, to the specific document that um, I think one of the selected. advantages, too, of Macintosh is that things happen so quickly. Uh, it certainly fits into the ergonomic pattern of, of the user interacting quickly with the, with the device. It's just very direct, no complicated sequence of commands to remember. We can, here's a, an old little bit of sample text. This is how the word processor appears to you. Um, a ruler lets you set formats, which is certainly a familiar object. Say you want to go from single to double space, just click on the wider image if you want. And you can justify or center. We're not going to have time, actually, but you could have pulled up pictures from Mac Paint from the scrapbook and then insert them and into the document. Paste them in just by saying paste from the menu. If you want to change a word to be bold, just say bold. Change the font to 
something like old English. Okay, I know you're having fun, Susan, <laughs> but I'm going to have to stop. You. It's hard when it's away. when it's your baby. I, got, to be I, I get the feeling. Well, thanks so much for showing off Mac to us, and thanks for joining us on this edition of the Computer Chronicle. One of the unique aspects of a personal computer is that it often has uh, bitmap color graphics, like the Apple II, for example. And that way you can do very dynamic things, games that you couldn't do, say, with a teletype style or scrolling uh, display you would find in a larger computer system. This particular game, obviously, is a pretty old vintage, and, and uh, they've gotten a lot more sophisticated since then, and we're going to see some of that today. Indeed, we've got a very exciting show. We'll be meeting some of the superstars of computer game programming from Electronic Arts, from Atari, and from Activision. And while the idea of computers in games may be new, the idea of people playing games with machines is not really new. Now that Got me. Got me. That was the studio are Steve Kitchen, designer of an incredible new game, Space Shuttle, from Activision, and Chris Crawford, one of the top game designers with Atari. Gary? Steve and Chris, uh, you're both, you both build computer-based games. Uh, do you call yourselves designers or programmers? I call myself a designer because most of the sweat and blood I expend occurs in the design phase, not in the programming phase. I spend a great deal of time worrying about what my audience will experience in the game, and only towards the end of the project do I actually get down to writing any code. And when you think about the design of the game, what are the elements of the game that make, make it interesting? Well, that has to do a great deal with what I'm trying to accomplish. I set a goal. I want a game to achieve a certain effect. I want to somehow communicate a message to my audience. That message then dictates the topic and the style of the game, the nature of the graphics, the feel. That's what mm -hmm. the texture of the game that I'm trying to build into it. That's what I uh, spend most of my time mm -hmm. worrying about. Chris, you're talking more like a writer rather than a computer programmer. Steve, is that how you see what you do? That's basically what we are. We're writers. We're writing a book, a novel, creating a vicarious universe in this computer program. Uh, we have to model everything we want, put every small detail in. Uh, very often, in my game, for instance, I had to do extensive research for a year and a half to understand my subject before I could distill the important aspects out and then put them into this cartridge. Like a writer would. Exactly like a writer would. When a writer writes a book, the book is a vicarious universe. You read it and become part of it. It's the same thing. When you play these games, these programs, uh, you vicariously become part of the universe that the, the programmer puts into it. Okay, you've got Space Shuttle up here, and uh, give us a demonstration of how this works. Well, this is an automatic demo flight we're going to fly. Uh, this is a complete space shuttle mission from launch to landing. This is actually themed after the STS-2 flight back in November of 1981. We're starting off now at Cape Kennedy in the morning. The clouds are rolling by, the sun is coming up, and we're doing our countdown now. Now at T-minus four seconds, we're going to turn our main engines on. You're going to see the thrust indicators at the top of the screen there moving along. There we go. At T-plus three seconds, the solid rocket boosters are going to turn on, and we're going to go through the clouds and off the pad. And there we go. Now, the aspect of the game here is to fly the space shuttle successfully into a 210 nautical mile orbit, doing all the control functions that an astronaut would really do, setting your yaw and your pitch, keeping on a trajectory line. Uh, at 26.2 nautical miles, the solid rocket boosters will jettison off. Now, this is a very important point of accuracy, is there's a yellow flash. There we go. Uh, this is something that wasn't noted until STS-1, when the first astronauts went up, that this actually happened. I had to find all of these details out about what you would experience if you were inside of the space shuttle and you were doing the flying so that when you play this game, you feel like you've actually flown. Steve, it seems to me the incredible thing is this game is running on an Atari 2600, not a computer. How do you squeeze all of this into that unit? Well, it takes a lot of time programming, coding. Um, you have to model the universe as you feel it should really be, and then you have to find how you can fit it all in piece by piece. You start off with a basic mission and then you add features and you add the functions all along the way. When I finished the game, I was not happy with it, and I had an additional list of 146 separate items I wanted to put in that I still felt were important. Uh, I, I spent an additional three months finishing those off and getting them all in. I wanted this to be absolutely accurate and absolutely complete. And yeah, it is. put this all inside of a, how big a ROM? It's, it's an 8K cartridge. 8K cartridge. <laughs> That's an incredible amount of... Uh, it took 13 months of programming, <laughs> and a lot of that time was spent putting it all together. Now, we've just achieved orbit. There's the Earth's room rolling underneath. The external tank will jettison. There it goes. And we've docked with an orbiting satellite, which actually was themed after the Skylab. 
In fact, Dr. Ed Gibson did a review on the game, and he noted that it looked like you were trying to, to fly into his old, uh, his old nemesis in space. Uh, and then we do our deorbit, and we come in for a landing at Edwards Air Force Base. Now, you're, one thing unique you did in adapting this game to the 2600 is using the switches in the, in, in the 2600 as, as functional switches. How did you do that? And what we had to do was, was I had to throw out all the old ideas of what this machine would do. Uh, this was originally a video game console, so I said, look, all these switches are controlled by the computer. I'm going to redefine them to be computer switches. I'm going to control the main engines, the backup engines, the cargo bay doors, the landing gear, the sequence of information on the screen. It became so different that we had to develop an overlay to fit over the, the screen. We had to develop a what's called a cheat sheet, which is just what the astronauts use. This gives you all the instructions that are necessary to fly your shuttle. And the instruction book is 30 pages long. And it gives you a lot of detail into exactly how to fly the space shuttle. And basically, it's a small flight manual. We provide a glossary. We provide drawings of the space shuttle, uh, engine indicators. Uh, here's a side view of the space shuttle that we provide. So really, you understand all about the space shuttle in order to fly this game accurately. You get a little pilot's license when you get through this? <laughs> uh, if you fly successfully, you receive a patch. And if you fly just as an astronaut would, you might get your wings. Uh, we're entering Earth's atmosphere now, and you see we're getting the uh, ionization cone that appears around the space shuttle. If you saw the movie The Right Stuff, you would see in the sequence with John Glenn. This is what the astronauts see in the window. This is hot ionized gas being superheated by the friction of the, the shuttle on the way in. We've even lost our signals. We've lost our altitude and speed information, and we've lost our computer screens. Steve, it seems uh, piloting the space shuttle is very difficult to do, one would think. Can a, a, a kid or a normal person actually pull this off? Well, what I did when I designed this was I, I understood that problem. Uh, having the average individual fly the space shuttle would take years of work. But I looked at how NASA trains its astronauts, and they start off, first of all, by giving them a, a lot of book exercises. They give them film strips of what it's like to fly the space shuttle. This is flight number one. You're seeing, essentially, a film strip. You can pick up the joystick and take control at any time you want to, but you don't have to. There's a second flight called a training flight, and that basically is like flying in a simulator. You can make mistakes, you can make errors, and the computer will compensate, and it will let you know. Mm -hmm. And then flight three is the actual real thing. So you work your way up to flying the actual mission. You can get into it very easily, and then work your way up and finally try to achieve your wings. The interesting thing about this game, I think, uh, is that it's, it is a, it's an educational learning experience as well as... Uh, Vicariously educational. Right. You're not sitting there playing flashcards. Mm -hmm. you're, you're learning about one of the most technologically advanced items mm -hmm. today. Well, there are the dual sonic booms that occur. The first one was the space shuttle. The second one was the chase planes. And we're, we're coming in now at Edwards Air Force Base. Um, when you get done mastering this game, you've effectively learned all about what an astronaut does when he's in orbit. So the next time you see a launch go off, you're going to know what he has to do, when he has to do it, and what he goes through. It's incredible. Uh, we need another minute or so before we land here. While we're waiting, Chris, uh, let's talk about you have Your new game is called Excalibur. What, what is that about? Excalibur is a game of leadership. The concept, I wanted to uh, express to people the ideas behind von Clausewitz's statement, war is the extension of policy to other means. That is, I was a little tired of war games that glorify war. So I wanted to show that, that war is something that sometimes cannot be avoided, but must never be uh, entered into in a cavalier manner. And so really, I was trying to teach concepts of leadership. And so in the game Excalibur, I... Uh, uh, I make you as King Arthur. I give you the task of unifying Britain. Now, unification is entirely different from conquest. That is, you have to convince people of your authority. You have to convince them to follow you. And that involves more than merely brute force. Chris, we have a little bit of time left. Can you get Excalibur up on the screen and show us yeah. just a piece of that? This is the title scene to Excalibur. And it's... Uh, does nothing more than give the title and set a tone and show off who did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was designed to run on the Atari 800, or? Yes, the, uh, uh, I've cut it off. Uh, this was designed for the 800 with 48K and a disk drive. It's a huge game. It actually won't fit on the 800. It requires disk swapping. And so you, uh, you bring in whole chunks of game at a time. It's, uh, it's actually 66K of object code. Very, very large game, all written in assembly. Joining us now is game designer Bill Budge, who works with Electronic Arts, and the president of Electronic Arts, Trip Hawkins. Bill, uh, there's quite an array of uh, games out here on the table. And what is it that makes a, a game successful, or what kind of factors go into the design of a game? Uh, it's really hard to, um, you can't ask people 
what they want to see on the computer and what kind of programs they want. I really think that a person writing a program has to have an inner conviction of something uh, and write a program that they want to write and a program that they want to use. Uh, when I started writing this program, it was something I really wanted to do. I wanted to see it work. And Where'd I, you get the idea for, for um, so I always liked building things, and it was a funny, indirect kind of process. I got tired of writing video games. I was really sick of playing them by this time. And I thought, well, it's fun to, to make video games. I still kind of like to write them, and I bet other people would really like to write them. You're talking about the pinball construction set. Right. And uh, this is kind of a nice game because it actually involves you in the construction of the game itself. It's kind of like a metagame. Well, yeah. Is the success of that been pretty good in, in the sense that is there a special segment that you're selling to as far as the construction well, set? Well, when you start out, yeah, you're looking uh, to really avant-garde computer mm -hmm. users. It takes a while for the message to get out there. When everyone is still discovering Pac-Man and a program comes along that's telling them they can build video games, well, it doesn't register at first. But it's got a slow growth that builds up, and, and finally now we're getting you know, very good results. The game kind of craze dies out. This stuff's taken off. Mm -hmm. Trip on, on the business side, what do you look for for a successful software game? Well, I think Pinball Construction Set has a lot of the things that you look for, and that's why it's, it's now one of the top ten sellers in the country, according to Billboard magazine. Uh, we have a philosophy of having products that are simple, hot, and deep. <clears throat> simple so that you don't have to read a lot of instructions. Of course, most people don't want to have to learn how to operate the computer. They want to just uh, do things with it right away. And Pinball Construction Set, you can immediately play one of the pinball games that are included, or you can quickly make up one of your own, and it's very simple to do that, as I think Bill will illustrate. Uh, we also like to have products that are hot, uh, in that they should fully use the sound and graphics and other capabilities of the machine. And we also look for programs that are deep. In the case of Pinball Construction Set, uh, you can make your own pinball game, so it has a lot of create, creative uh, possibilities and allows people to control what they're going to make and interact with it and change it. And that's one of the things that extends the uh, life of the product and causes people to come back to it again and again. It's kind of fun to take a look at this. I'm it? dying. I'm <laughs> dying to say, go ahead, Bill. Okay, well, you know, if this is a, a very simple sort of real-world idea. It's a construction set. You have uh, something that you're building on this side of the screen and a set of parts over here. And I have a hand here that I control with the joystick, and I use that to move things around, say, on the board, the game I'm building. I can modify this game. And uh, I can get parts out of the box, and I can just add them over. So they're kind of bumpers here. you're putting into your game. I'm here. just putting bumpers, yeah. This is a, a favorite of really young kids. They like to just grab a whole bunch of bumpers, fill the board up with them, and put a ball on there. A pinball aficionado would, would gasp, but little kids don't really build pinball machines. They just sort of build things with this. And I can get a ball and put that over here. Then if I want to try out the game, I can just push this uh, menu selection right here, and the game starts to play. Now you can see I've got two balls, one up there. I can launch this one. And I can go out and play the game a little bit, and the balls drop down at the, at the bottom eventually. Uh, but before I let that happen, I'll just go back to the parts box and start editing again, get rid of some of these. Bill, this was kind of a, a new level, I suppose, of, of computer game where you really can design the game yourself. What, what, if you can tell us, what are you working on now? What would be the next step in computer games? Um, I want to extend the idea of a construction set. I think this, is, uh, this one was hard to do when I started and, uh, because there are lots of combinations and things you can't really predict when you're making a kit to make a meta game, as you said. Um, I'd like to extend the idea even further, and the problem there is then designing the parts box. In pinball, it's a small set of parts. You don't really have to worry about... Um, thinking up abstractions um, and a general um, construction set, it's not clear what the parts should be. It's almost like you're inventing a new language for representing um, specifications for programs. It gets a very difficult computer science um, problems. Trip, uh, at the arcade level, we hear that maybe you know games sort of peaked and people aren't quite as interested. Are computer games uh, here to stay or is it a fad? I think computer games are fundamentally different from video games, mainly because computer technology in the home can be extended and become a much broader uh, base of technology. Uh, just as an example, all of these programs that we're talking about here, uh, they come on floppy disks, and each one of these holds much more memory than can be held in the memory of a coin-operated arcade game. And it really is, it, it becomes a, uh, a question of the program size when you finally want to know how good a program can I have and how much can I do with it and how long will it take before I'm bored with it or I've exhausted the educational value. And I can get, uh, oh, something like three or four times more program on here than I can fit into the memory of a, of a coin-operated game. Okay, you've got one-on-one you've on one there. Maybe we can get it loaded. Well, I think, Gary, you had a question. 
Well, the only thing I was going to mention is it seems like the games have gone from relatively unsophisticated games to something that requires a lot of sophistication in terms of programming, and, and uh, the memory size is really an important thing, important aspect mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, it's hard to really so. put that back into 8K. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has that been the difference, really, in the, you know, the early computer games, you know, pretty limited now, the incredible graphics and speed? Has it really been a function of the available memory? Uh, it, part of it is just programmers getting uh, better, I think. Uh, not many people wrote video games five years ago. There was a mm -hmm. small selection. Now there are thousands of people who are capable of writing a good video game. And uh, a few people have upped the ante, so it's not enough maybe to write a video game. You have to write a video game plus a game editor. I think the more popular games really have... The, these extra features built in. Can we get one-on-one -on -one in there? That's a kind of exciting uh, demonstration of what you can do. And I think, uh, Tripp, you're going to take on either Dr. J or Larry Bird here. Is that right? Tell us about one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, well, the basic idea of one-on-one -on -one was to get these two guys, uh, Julie Serving and Larry Bird, who are the, uh, the, probably the two best-known basketball players and probably the two best forwards that have ever played the game, and uh, to capture their personalities in the game. And so we decided to hire them to help us design the game, and we had photo sessions where we took pictures of them in action. In fact, we had a camera mounted at mid-court just exactly from this angle while we photographed them. And then we worked with them on prototypes of the product where we'd sit down and talk to them about the moves that they would use and the, some of the strategies and the shooting percentages that they would have in different places on the court. And that was a fascinating learning experience. But you say programmed in the personality. I mean, these characters play like Larry Bird. Will Very much so. In fact, why don't I go ahead and get go started? Ahead, yeah. Right now, they're playing against one another in a demonstration game. But I, if I press the button on my joystick, it'll take me to a menu, and I can quickly make a selection. I, w I want to play against the computer. I'm going to allow the computer to play Larry Bird, and I'm going to play at the uh, varsity level. There are different levels uh, depending on how good a player I am. And now I go ahead and start the game. And that, that's uh, Larry Bird taking an outside shot, and he hit it. Now, Bird is particularly effective at outside shots. But watch Julius now. I'm going to be able to uh, drive around him, I hope. Oops, he stole okay, the ball from Now, me. you're Larry Bird now. No, I'm J Dr. J. You're Dr. J. I let Bird the, steal the, the ball. Larry, okay. He's trying to work his way into the basket. <clears throat> so he's got a quick 4 nothing lead over me. <laughs> oh, and now I have to have the indignation of seeing an instant replay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Where do you think, uh, Trip, the software games are going to next? I mean, what's the next generation of this kind of stuff? I, I, I hate to interrupt you and try to, trying to get back on well, I had to, had to have a slam dunk there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, what's happening next? I mean, what's the next tier, the next level of, of computer well, games? Well, at a really simplistic level, Maybe you could turn it's, very level to, uh, it's very easy to extend the uh, realism and the graphics that are in the current products. And I think it's also... Uh, you're going to increasingly see more creative possibilities for the player, which is, which is I think, where a lot of the educational value comes from. Uh, being able to create your own pinball game is one example. We've extended that with Music Construction Set to a product that uh, is about music. And, of course, there are a lot of people that are really interested in music and interested in having their children learn about music. And it uses a lot of the ideas that Bill pioneered with the pinball construction set. And I think that the, uh, the area where the greatest challenges will come is is in looking for original ideas and new creative ways to break the mold. I mean, a lot of people uh, look at what other people have done and try to do something that's a spin-off from that, but the, the really creative geniuses in the industry are capable of coming up with something completely new. Do they just come to you they, they say, we've got an idea and here's a, here's a program I've written and then you turn around and sell it? It, 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 happen, it happens all different ways. We have one of our better products, it's called Hard Hat Mac, and two high school boys came into our office one day and they had three sheets of high school notebook paper they'd drawn up in their physics class and, and we signed a contract access is made possible that. by a grant from Popular Computing, a McGraw-Hill magazine. In the random access file, Hewlett Packard has made another major move into the personal computer field with a new portable printer designed for the PC market. It is a non-impact inkjet printer with low noise operation, battery powered, 150 characters per second, and an 11 by 12 character matrix. The price is under $500 and it will be available next month. IBM in the news again this week. First of all, IBM announced a licensing agreement with Intel to allow IBM to produce its own 8088 chips, the microprocessor used in the PC. Tremendous demand on Intel's output of the 8088 has kept IBM from producing enough PCs to meet its demand. Perhaps more important, though, is the fact that Intel apparently also gave IBM the right to make its own 8286 chips, a much more advanced microprocessor, which analysts believe IBM will use in its new personal computer, codenamed Popcorn. 
with the ability to turn out the chips, it is thought that IBM may now be able to introduce the popcorn this summer. The use of the advanced microprocessor will enable popcorn to do sophisticated graphics and other complex integrated functions. Sounds like popcorn may take on the Macintosh Lisa Cow. One foreign country very much on the mind of high-tech executives is Japan, with particular attention focused now on the debate in the Japanese parliament on a new proposed software bill which would limit software copyright protection for U.S. products to 15 years and force American companies to allow Japanese firms to sell U.S.-made software. The net result would be little protection for American American manufacturers with Japanese companies able to sell the same software at a lower price by avoiding the high research and development cost. And speaking of software, you say you have a modem but can't use all the bells and whistles because you don't have the right communication software? Listen to Paul Schindler. Okay, it's all set. Three men in a monkey suit. Uh, listen, uh, I'm going to have to get back to you later. Bye-bye. Communications. Did you know that using one of these devices, called modems, Computers can talk on the phone, just like us, only faster. But if you already have PC communications, you might be surprised to hear that you're in a minority. Fewer than one-fourth of PCs communicate. So many of you are waiting to make the plunge. Perhaps the hundreds of communications packages on the market have daunted you. Well, the Whole Earth Software Catalog and Review has sorted communications out for beginners. Now, if your computer runs the CPM operating system, we suggest you consider MITE or Modem 7. For users of the IBM PC, the best packages are SmartCom 2 and Crosstalk 16. PC Talk 3 is more limited, but then at $35, it's also the cheapest communications package. Apple computer users may want TSC Terminal if they use 40 column screens, or Data Capture 2 for 80 columns. Commodore and Radio Shack users will find CompuServe's Vidtex a best buy. Now, there simply isn't time to get into all the wonderful things you can do once you have communications, but believe me, a PC on the phone opens up new worlds. Just ask someone who already has a modem. Call them or call their computer. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. Those of us involved with micros back in 1974-75, we had not already designed all of the interface cards and the peripherals and the software that goes into the mini computers of the day or the larger systems. And to us, it was so exciting because it was like we thought we were doing the things for the first time they'd ever been done. And it was all it was was it was the first time they'd ever been done that cheap using a lot of the LSI technology. And so there was a lot of just the excitement everywhere we went. It was like putting out a little table and showing off a little card that would play music on a computer or make color was uh, the most exciting thing in the world and we thought we were way ahead of the rest of the world. What I was doing around that time was not even thinking about what, it, what are the right steps to take to have a very large successful company or a large successful product. It was just I, I had been working my whole life to build a certain type of computer for myself and I just built the best one that was doable in that day with the particular components available etc. And um, in that sense it wasn't sort of like it wasn't like an intelligence that, that can lead you towards the right path. It was just being very free. I, was, I had the freedom because I was only doing it for myself. It was not a company project where a manager defined what, you know, what had to be done. So I was lucky to be able to do what I did. Everywhere I go now, I go to, I go to business meetings and presentations and they're all sitting there in three-piece suits. It's a large business. There's a lot of dollars involved. The people who have come out of school trained to run and manage business is the key element today and that's where most of the creativity is going. There's very few technical technically creative products in the microcomputer world. Is a garage operation still feasible in the small computer industry today or is that stage over? Well that stage is pretty much becoming over for hardware. It used to be people could quickly manufacture some simple little PC boards on a small budget, get a, an ad in a little hobbyist magazine and start selling a bunch of them. And So very small entrepreneurships, thousands of them sprung up, many of them centered around Apple. That was probably the, the biggest direction to go. Uh, now it's pretty much that's possible for software groups to come up with a good software project and there are avenues to find companies that will market it for you or turn it into a product if you've got something good going. It, you know, perhaps once a decade, a very large market comes from zero up to billions of dollars within a few years. It's very rare that it, there's such a dramatic explosion out of nowhere of a new market. It may happen again in microelectronics and computers before too long. Maybe every 10 years, a new group of people come out, and they haven't been along with the Apple and the thousands of peripherals and the thousands of softwares, and they think every time they're doing it, they're doing it for the first time ever. They're going to get a, a couple of their own hobby computer magazines that are 
in their group. They don't come to our group. They're going to start talking and having little trade shows and showing each other projects, and they'll start new businesses of their own. And I think that's probably about to happen. It's like you go to a trade show and they pull up in their mobile home and it's a little garage shop. You know, they pull it out the back and they show it off. And you want to buy a couple? And uh, you know, these may be very large companies in a few years. But right now we all shun them on them. We just say, oh, you know, that's just a couple of guys who drove out of their home with it. That's what they said about us. Yeah. I, I can, you can understand it. When you're looking down at someone else, you can understand how you were perceived back in those days, and then you also realize they were right. It's just a quirk of faith that. that in they fact, were I wrong. remember you when we were at Intel, we were working on some documentation together, and that must have been in '73. That's right. Yes. And uh, I know that a lot of viewers probably have some questions about, you know, is it possible really to get into this industry now, or has it been completely dominated by companies like IBM and Tandy and so forth? Is there a place uh, for, for a young inventor to really make, make his mark? Well, I think that all depends really in what area. If you want to build a microcomputer, it's probably not a good idea at this point because it's going to be the clash of the titans now. Mm -hmm. There's nothing high-tech about microcomputers anymore. It's very simply, you know, it's like building a washing machine or a refrigerator, quite honestly. It's the economics of volume and reliability, and that's it. That's the end of it. If, on the other hand, you want to go into some other area, good grief, you know, there's probably more opportunities today than there's ever been. It, it's just that you're better off uh, building razor blades rather than razors. If the opportunities are not in computers, where are these areas in which there are opportunities? Peripherals, add-ons, software, you, know, you can make a lot of money with extra cards that will fit into a popular computer, attachments, mm -hmm. peripherals, particularly the software industry. Now, it's very much in its infancy right now. The organization and methodology uh, is going to undergo massive change, but on the other hand, there will be probably 10 to 100 times as much software sold every year, five or six years from now, as there is now. Obviously, that's hypergrowth. Obviously, that's whether there are, there are the opportunities. Adam, you talked about the titans, by the way. Who do you see as the titans right now? Well, IBM's obviously there. I'm quite certain that AT&T are going to come in to challenge them in a big way, and there will be one or more Japanese companies that come in as well, and they're going we to dominate the market. We hear about the falling out that is starting to take place and will take place in the computer field, and Adam People cite your company is, is one of those examples. Is that, in fact, uh, something that has to happen and is going to happen? Well, Osborne Computer's failure was nothing to do with falling out. It was nothing to do with uh, industry uh, competition or collapse. The company, plain and simple, committed suicide. Um, all I will say about it right now is that everything you have read in the paper, you can hit the reset button on because it's not right. This is not yet the right time for me to say what really happened, so I'm not going to. So you don't, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, no, but uh, very specifically, y your answer is partially yes and partially no. Uh, if IBM were not consuming 70% of the market, which they are right now, today, you know, the numbers that you read about are actually inaccurate. IBM dominates the market far more than any of the statistics you read. What I like to say, you know, I've said before, is that IBM is one. There is no second. You know, after mm -hmm. IBM, the, it picks up again at somewhere like fifth or sixth. <laughs> you know, if they weren't there, clearly a lot of other people would be able to do a lot better. But on the other hand, if you take 30% of the market, it is so huge that it will support an awful lot of people mm -hmm. who are selling three, four, five, ten thousand computers a month. Mm -hmm. uh, they're sure, there'll be a shakeout, but then you know, th there's been a shakeout in the hardware industry. Gary, you remember a lot of the early companies. Where's I Insa? You know, where's yeah. where's Mint? Yes, I mean, yeah. it's, it's been going on for years. It's not been okay. We are unfortunately limited to brief comments about a very few computer entrepreneurs who typify the vast contributions of their colleagues. But we can't leave this subject without one more example. That of the original Silicon Valley garage-based startup, Hewlett Packard. William Hewlett and David Packard both graduated from Stanford University in 1934. The two engineering classmates became close friends and formed their partnership in 1939. Their first plant was a small garage in Palo Alto and their initial capital investment around $500. Their first product was a resistance capacity audio oscillator based on a design developed by Hewlett while attending graduate school.
Hewlett Packard has grown to be a major designer and manufacturer of computers and computer peripherals, test and measurement instruments, handheld calculators, electronic components, medical electronic equipment and instrumentation for chemical analysis. The company employs about 70,000 people worldwide with annual sales between four and five billion dollars. Packard and Hewlett have been extremely influential in the industry and both remain active in the company as chairman of the board and vice chairman respectively. We'll meet Gene Amdahl in our next segment so let's get back to our program. Joining us now is Gene Amdahl, formerly of IBM, formerly of Amdahl Corporation, and now of Trilogy Systems, Inc. Welcome, Gene. Gene, uh, I think it's uh, very interesting to have your perspective on IBM and the IBM PC lookalikes that have come out here, because you've been, if there's anybody that's been uh, working with uh, following IBM and, and trying to uh, get at that customer's base, it's been Amdahl. Uh, and so what is your feeling about the IBM PC clones or the lookalikes? Are, can they be successful? Well, I'm not as familiar with the PC area as I am with the hot, large computer area, but I am quite familiar with IBM, and their pattern really hasn't changed over all of the years that I've known them. And that is they move into a field when the field is just proven well enough in terms of uh, it becoming of a size sufficiently large to be of interest, and secondly, that somebody has learned what it takes to satisfy that market. Once this is learned, uh, IBM is then ready to move in for their share of the action. And if they are, have the same degree of success in this area as they had in the high performance area, their architecture will become a de facto standard, not because they will have the best architecture, but because so many people will be expecting them to be successful. Mm -hmm. And the cost of developing your applications on your, even your personal computer, are going to uh, be sufficiently great so that even as a person, an individual, you really won't like to change architectures in order to uh, progress through the uh, advancements. Well, I think that uh, the major difference between the PC market as it is today and uh, the mar industry that Gene was talking about is the fact that it's really got nothing to do with high-tech anymore. And for that reason, I would both agree and disagree with what Laurie said. I think the bulk of the clone companies existing today won't make it. The reason is that they look upon themselves as computer manufacturers. However, I believe that there is a vast market for clone companies. The reason is that uh, a rough kind of estimate that we've made is that there's something like 15% of the market where hell will freeze over before they'll buy IBM. There's 15% of another 15% of the market that don't care and 70% of the market who prefer IBM. Now 15% of the market is huge. Furthermore, there's another consideration. If you're talking about uh, people who are looking at it as though it's a dishwasher or a refrigerator, you're now talking about people who can come in to a huge install base. IBM is shipping 10,000 PCs a day right now. It doesn't really matter very much if they do go on to something else. The base they leave behind is so big that there are a lot of people who can run out their inventories. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, because they're building entirely on a low-cost, high-quality basis, you get somebody who comes in who knows how to manufacture and they can start eating into the IBM PC market more than they ever could a mainframe market because it's the same. For the very fact that it's the same, people eventually say, well, what have I got to lose? If a piece goes wrong, it's almost interchangeable. So the, people, the companies that would be successful are the ones that think of themselves as manufacturing companies rather than computer companies. That's right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and sitting in this week for Gary Kildall is Herb Lechner of SRI. Herb, what we have up on our Apple computer here today is the Koala Micro Illustrator and my handy Koala Pad here. And we see a menu of some artists' choices. And if I can, I'm going to try to communicate to you here uh, in some computer graphics. And so far, it's working. If I get your name right. There we go. And I can even make it a little more sexy than that. We'll give you a little brighter background color so it's a kind of more upbeat message. Uh, Herb.
computer graphics is the subject of our show today, and computer graphics, in fact, involves more than just this little thing we're playing with, or even video games, which some people associate with computer graphics. There are some pretty serious applications, aren't there? Very much so, Stuart. Uh, computer fine art hangs in galleries right alongside of traditional art. And, of course, in the commercial area, uh, computers aid animators and uh, are, play a very important role in TV advertising uh, today. And, of course, the basic building blocks of computer art, that is, the graphics uh, subsystems, uh, play a role not only in art, but in related activities such as computer-aided design and other graphic ap applications. Since the first light pen and graphics displays of the 1950s, computer-assisted artwork has been associated with beautiful, if mathematical, images of symmetry and abstraction. But the applications today extend far beyond repetitive patterns. With enough computing power, computer graphics can extend an artist's reach to cover the height and length of a wall, or compress the time it takes to animate something from a month to an hour. Using a digitizing tablet, MIT artist Ron McNeil chooses from a palette of colors and pre-programmed images to create a collage that exists only in the computer's memory. Before ever seeing a canvas, it undergoes some dramatic transformations. Starting with materials from different sources like photographs or three-dimensional objects, the composite can be manipulated to change in color, size, or geometric aspect. The screen-sized image shown here is only an intermediate step toward the final hard copy, a painting that is 14 feet high and 48 feet long. Like a colossal paintbrush with a memory, the giant XY plotter magnifies the completed artwork into a wall-sized mural, strip by strip and color by color. As an ingenious collaboration between digital imagery and robotics, the giant plotter is unique. But the special talents of computer graphics are increasingly used in another area of the visual arts, animation. To an art form that was once the near-exclusive province of film, computers offer a much faster method of animating images. Again, through a digitizing tablet, an artist can create a figure by drawing in just enough points to determine its size and rough shape. For a symmetrical object, all the computer needs is the outline of one side, which is then shaped into a fluid form, regenerated, and filled in with color and three-dimensional detail. The software calculates and reproduces the characteristics of light and shadow that the object would possess in 3D. Finally, to animate the drawing, the artist specifies some key camera positions from which the object is viewed in space. The program then fills in the missing frames that simulate movement between those points. Making a drawing come to life is the most tedious part of an animator's job. Fortunately, it is also readily adaptable to digital processing. The systems used to produce these images are not designed to replace artists, but to assist them. And with enough human talent, they can mimic reality in detail or expand it to the fringes of our imagination. Well, this is a, uh, an 8-bit microcomputer, which is very similar to the type of uh, computers that most of the viewers uh, would use in their home, for instance, to play games. Uh, and we use these type of systems, for instance, to create imagery for digital directories and, uh, and uh, ed education software and such like that. And, and what exactly do you show us how you use this system here? Okay, well, w the traditional artist tool is, uh, is a, a brush. This is an electronic artist tool, and it's using a graphics tablet, which you see here, and an electronic pen. And with this, I can, I can uh, uh, paint images and uh, put uh, graphics, combined graphics, photographic images, and text uh, on the screen. I can very quickly load in an image here, for instance, to show you a, uh, a raw photographic image that was uh, input using a video digitizer, which is simply a video camera. And once I get the uh, image into the computer... That's an unfortunate example, by yeah. the way. Michael, but we'll go with <laughs> Once I get the image into the computer, then I can uh, use this graphics tablet to take away parts of the image that I don't want. As you can see here, it's loading in this microcomputer. What do you mean by parts of the images you don't want, Michael? Well, for instance, uh, maybe I want to take out a background and put in another background, or I want to take out areas where I would like to put in other types of things, like text and things like that, which I'll demonstrate here. I'll show you, uh, for instance, I'm showing you the build of an image. Don, while Michael is working here a second, uh, there are great memory demands, aren't there, in doing graphics? Uh, how do you accomplish that with, a, with just a small microcomputer? 
Well, and it really, it depends on the exact amount of memory. The, the memory uh, requirements really are the requirements of the amount of color that you have, and uh, and also the what we call the resolution of the screen. So the, the higher and smoother the image appears, the more memory is required. Uh, in the case of what you'll see later today, we have approximately three million bytes of of memory just used to store an image mm -hmm. uh, in real time. Okay, Michael, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, you're ready. Okay, now I've taken away the background, and now I've put in a cartoon bubble here, and then I can load in another uh, image here to show you uh, other things that I've... Uh, so you're loading images you've pre-prepared. Yes, yeah, so I pre-prepared these images. How did you go about getting the old background out? Did you trace around it or something? <clears throat> Uh, yes, you can uh, you can block it out with a function on the tablet uh, using a, bl a black background block out, and then so as you can see the image is slowly building here, and then I'll show you the final image that I've created, and then I can uh, show you how you can manipulate that image other ways also. What what is the tab the tablet you're using? Tell me how that works. Well. It works by uh, uh, addressing various areas in the computer memory, and essentially it's giving it a command either to put color onto the screen or putting uh, ge uh, geometric uh, figures on the screen like circles or grids. And you can also put text on the screen, as you see here. Here's the final image I've built, which has a combination of a photographic image. Mm -hmm. It has graphics in the background, and it has uh, text also combined with those graphics. And I've been able to do that with this tablet. I can also, for instance, do things like turn the image upside down, or I can also flip-flop the image this way here, and then I could bring it back up. I can also invert the colors, for instance, so I can make it negative or make them in new colors. And then there are other functions on the tablet, too, that you can do. Uh, for instance, you can create textures with uh, what's called electronic brushes and things like that. Hmm. Okay, well, we're moving our way up from the simple koala pad to something more sophisticated. And, Don, that gets us into your area. And I think you have your iris system set up over in the other part of the uh, studio here. So let's take a walk over and see what iris does. Don, how does your iris system here differ from what we've seen up until now? Up until now, it's really we've really been looking at microcomputers, really personal computers. And this is really a different class of machine. The biggest difference, though, that separates us out is the idea of us using custom chips developed by Silicon Graphics for our own use to do these three-dimensional calculations. This example here is the Rubik's Cube, and what's, what's going on here is we're calculating the location of all the endpoints of all the faces so that we can rotate those in 3D and do all the hidden surface removals all in a very real-time mode. Why don't we go on to the next okay. uh, demonstration here to give a, an idea of how our machine can be used. What kind of machine, what's the hardware we're using here, Don? This is a terminal configuration that has a little floppy disk on top, but the, the uh, basic computer that we're using here is a Motorola 68000, often used in some of the other um, reasonably high-performance microcomputers. Micro uh, other, the other chips that we actually have are, are called what we call our geometry engine, and it's a high-speed three-dimensional floating point calculation uh, unit that, that runs at six and a half million floating point operations per second. Um, this speed we, in, we are planning to enhance to over 10 million floating point operations just in a, in a okay, few what, minutes. What's the demo here? This one is a series of uh, pictures of a, a series of buildings where we're doing a calculation in, in real time. So I'm going to angle up away from the buildings and I'm going to zoom back away. And as I'm zooming away, you can see this, this building get, going further and further back. You can see that the light sourcing is done so that uh, the certain surfaces that are closer to the, to the rays of sun are, are visible. Now what I'll do is I'll add uh, buildings in 3D. So you can see as I move around the space, I can actually get the full panoramic effect of this block. Or I can even zoom in. So I can go through areas. Let's okay. skip on to the next. The next is... What, uh, uh, before we get to that, Don, what would the application be, say, of something like this architectural thing you just showed me? Um, <clears throat> we have several customers that are in the A, E, and C market, the architectural engineering and construction business, and we have several local companies that are doing piping diagrams and piping calculations for intersections of pipes in, say, nuclear plants. Another case might be for an architectural firm that would, would add software to our product and sell it to the end-user end architectural people for doing building design, for doing uh, construction of faces, uh, landscape architectural design, um, even an interior decorating, use it to place desks and 
uh, furniture within a given room. Okay, tell me about this demo now. Okay, this one is, uh, again, it's a three-dimensional object. Uh, it's a, rep a rendering of a robot. So the first thing I'm going to do here is, is get it a little bit larger. And then I'll, what I'll do is I'll tip it over so you can actually look at this robot arm from the top. And I'll spin the, the arm around. And now as I'm closer, let me uh, tilt it back up so you can see it from, front, from the front view. And in this case, what I'm doing is I have a uh, one button. By touching it, I can cause the shoulder to, to, to move the entire arm up and down. Or I can cause um, another button can cause the forearm to move up and down. And then the last series, I can cause the pinchers to actually open and close or to even grip something. This, an application for this might be an auto assembly plant where you're grabbing a, a metal part to be welded into an, another area. OK, we That's have time maybe for one more, and I'll load your disk for you. OK, this is another uh, sophisticated 3D application where we're actually computing the location of an aircraft in flight. So the first thing that will happen is we'll be looking out the front of the, the um, airplane at a, a, a building or a hangar, and then we're going to taxi up the runway, make a right turn, taxi down the runway, make another right turn, and take off. OK, and you talked about the speed of about 6.5 million. What was the units? Floating point computations per second. Um, most computers are measured in MIPS, and some are measured in what's called FLOPS. And the uh, difference being that it's either an integer mathematics or it's a floating point mathematics. Okay, let's see what this is. Okay, the, so what I'm doing now is I'm sitting at the runway, and I'm, I'm going, to, going to accelerate the uh, plane as it goes toward the building. I'm turning the rudder now using the mouse and locking in on a direction. And then I'm going to sweep, sweep around and get back onto the main runway. And now, as I uh, accelerate the plane still further, raise the flaps, just like in a normal takeoff, I can switch between the, uh, the viewing angle of the pilot looking um, out the front of the window to the viewing angle of the, um, okay. from the tower. And now I'm off the ground. Fox is, in fact, in use right now on television graphics. How is it being used? Uh, well, the, most of the networks have actually got several, several of these systems. And they very often use the mach machine for uh, their news production. And uh, practically every night, you will see some form of uh, over-the-shoulder shot that's probably been generated on the paint box. But hopefully, it's so good you would never notice. Now, this system gives you the capability of mixing that which is artistically drawn with that which is real-life photograph mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort of a thing. How is that done? Well, actually, I can just go to the live source, and you can see that right now we're taking in a live video source of what we're doing, and at any time, I can. I don't even look at myself. Let's just tap something down and see what we have here. There we have me. And okay, I can so go ahead and manipulate this right now. you have just captured a still frame from mm -hmm. this live coverage of what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And now you can paint with it. Right. Or I could, let's say I'd like to create a stencil. And just very quickly, I can go in here with a stencil medium and just outline something and fill it. And you're fill why are you filling that now? What I'm going to do is a cut and paste technique. This is a stencil medium that's laid over the image. What I'll do is... This is the word, word processing of art. Yeah, cut and paste. Okay. That's it. Yes. Um, and then I'll just paste it up. At this point, we're taking a portion of that image, and we've now got, as you can see, two images. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> Twins. No, I think that's the last improvement. That's Twins. right. That's right. <laughs> and you, you seem to have a lot of fun doing this. Is there uh, an obst Is there resistance to a, an artist, or shall we say a pure artist who's used to dealing in brushes and paints, uh, getting comfortable with using this technology? Um, Maybe at first there's a, it's a little difficult to use the menu, to learn to think and actually read at the same time while you're drawing. But once you've worked with the system for a short period of time, it's just like second nature. Very simple to use. Set up in artist terms. The, uh, it's clear how valuable this would be to a television media. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the area of fine art? And uh, is, is uh, computer art catching on there too, oh, or growing? Definitely, definitely. It's the wave of the future. That's what's going to be happening in art in a couple of years. In fact, it already is. Should brush brush manufacturers worry? No, I mean, no, no. They're not in trouble yet. <laughs> not yet.
Kevin, we have about a minute left. How far can you go with this technology? Will we get to the point where you could have, uh, where we could be replaced by animated people and sync it up with words? I sincerely hope not. Uh, <laughs> the way I see it at the moment is that we're providing the means by which an artist can extend their capabilities. We can turn a reasonable artist into a good one and an extremely good one into a superb artist. It's, there's, all we're doing is allowing them to create, create their artwork in a much shorter space of time and in the medium in which it's required. Well, that's fascinating. and You don't exist anymore on that picture, Kevin. The use of computers in musical composing is not a new idea, but recent advances are giving composers a new degree of power over their medium the ability to create and manipulate sound waves of their own design. Systems like MIT's Music 100 can dissect a note into its sound wave components. The composer can then make adjustments to each aspect of the note's physical characteristics independently and instantly. Specially developed music languages translate the sound processing as specified by the composer. From this input, a digital data stream is computed. Finally, the digital form is translated into a signal for amplification, pre-recorded, and played back over audio tape during the performance. A computer that can reassemble the building blocks of a sound wave opens up a new spectrum to the composer and the musician, a range of sounds beyond the natural limits of mechanical instruments and the human voice. In a sense, the music program can compose not only the score, but the instrument as well. The next step in computer-composer interaction is real-time production synthesis, a live interactive performance between computer and instrument. To achieve this kind of instantaneous but programmed manipulation requires very high-speed computers capable of several hundred million calculations per second. Operation, and you're selling a $40 software. Uh, from your end, how do you see computers and music meshing? I mean, how did you get involved in this combination? Well, I think computers are, are a way that people can be introduced to music and with this program what we tried to do is allow a person who doesn't know anything about music and who might be intimidated even by it um, to go out and, and to fool around with music already already created or, or to create his own and uh, be able to do everything just, just with a joystick. Maybe you can show us a little bit about how a music instruction set works. Okay. Well, basically, you're moving around with the joystick, a little hand. And that hand represents your hand. So in order to create music, what you do is you move your hand around and you pick up notes and you set them on the staff, which you see there. After you get the notes set up on the staff, you can move to one of these little pictures here, and the pictures do things. Uh, for instance, if you want to play the music, you go to the little piano, which is there. Or if you want to... Uh, go to the home position, which is at the beginning of the song. You go to little home and press the button. I've got a piece here that is included with the product, and so I'll move the hand down to the piano and press the button. It'll play through the piece. And going to the home, we can go no, back no, to the beginning of the song. The, the notes going across the staff or showing us the music that the computer's right. playing at the time. Right. Basically, it's uh, tying together what it sounds like and what is on the screen. So it's like having uh, sheet music in front of you that, that scrolls right past your desk. Uh, whereas with the sheet music, you can pick up your pencil and eraser and erase notes and change them or move them around or even pull out the scissors and cut and paste in different areas. With this, you can move your hand around, pick up a note, move it somewhere else, and drop it. If you want to sharpen a note, you just and pick up... And what you did is, is press the button to hear what the note on that particular place sounds like. Right. Actually, I dropped the note, and which actually changed the music that's in there right now. So if I played this, it wouldn't sound very pretty. Uh, it also tells me what that note sounds like. Um, so if I were composing music, for instance, or just wanted to know where it was, I could tune my ear. It certainly makes uh, learning about music a lot more fun. <laughs> a lot of fun. You can start it's out, instead of having to learn to play an instrument, um, you have to learn to use a joystick, which isn't all that difficult. But you can start out by taking 
uh, Mozart or Bach and then fooling around with it and changing notes and seeing what seeing uh, what it sounds how like. Does, how does what you're doing differ from the music construction set? Well, we're both in the music business and we're both, in fact, using computers to do things that are musical. The key concept behind Centauri and what we do with music, simply music, is turn it into a musical instrument, a live musical oh. instrument that you can play, you can listen to, you can transform sounds with, you can design sound, you can compose, and you can even learn keyboard. So what I actually can show you today is a program we call Simply Music. What I'm looking at on the screen here is a list of albums. Just as I have a 45 RPM record on my player or 33, so I have a diskette. It goes into my disk drive. And now when I do a directory or catalog, I can see the list of songs I have previously recorded or someone else recorded, loaded in. Well, why don't we listen to Yezu? Now, I played that piece in a couple of weeks ago, or someone else did, or perhaps you played it in yesterday. If you're learning to play keyboard, though, listening to music is not just what you need to do. You also need to see what's going on. So we're using the power of the computer now to give you a keyboard instrument that you can play and listen to, give you a video screen that shows you the music you're playing, and... If you uh, don't know how to read music, I will help you even further. I can load in a display of the keyboard itself so that when I play back Yezu, I can see the parts that were played. Now that's a fairly complex piece. If I were learning to play music, if I'd never approached a musical instrument before or a computer music system, I might choose a more easy to learn song. For instance, Merrily. Now, this is a pretty simple song, but it gets the point across that you too can learn to play keyboard with this fairly fancy technology just by That sounds like segue music. With audio tape from your system at Stanford. We're going to play that tape right now. And if you mm -hmm. can put on the headset so that you can hear it as we play it. And, and tell us what's going on in this audio tape. Okay, this is an example of high quality uh, vocal synthesis using frequency modulation synthesis. Uh, it took, a, took me about uh, oh, six months to find the, the little cues to naturalness that seem to be so very often lacking in, in most electronic uh, music synthesis. Now, having worked out this algorithm, we can play the next example and hear an extension of nature into a slightly unreal domain. For example, I've modeled now the human voice, but of a very, very large man. So it's deeper than any real human being could sing, as if uh, he had a six-foot chest, chest, I guess, and a three-foot neck. So the vocal resonances are greatly amplified because we have this independent control over the dimensions of sound in its abstract form. Now, one of the most important things about synthesis, and uh, which will accrue to devices as, as, uh, such as this and the things that little synthesis algorithm that Will was using, uh, has to do with using the technology in such a way that we, we, ha we have a, a very clear sense of what's natural sounding. The next example demonstrates first just a pure tone, which we'll, we'll hear, which is the pitch of what will become a sung vocal tone. Then, in a few seconds, we add all the harmonics or information that would be present in a real sung tone, but it only becomes natural at the moment we introduce the vibrato and this, this kind of wiggling in the pitch space, which uh, is common Carthus, to all natural sounds. Do you see sounds, a kind of new form of music publishing in which you can buy floppy disks for a computer playback system? Absolutely. In fact, uh, my floppy disk is my personal diskette. I can self-publish, which means that now I'm a composer and a publisher all rolled up into one. That is, I have my Centauri. I save, I generate my own music. I save it on uh, diskette, and I can send it off to friends across the country or around the world. So now every, every musician and every student becomes a publisher, and that means also that the teachers become publishers of their own musical material, and the professional composers can also publish for the audience of people who have the same instrument. So absolutely, yes, it is a new form of publishing, but a very personal one. <laughs> 